Welcome to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal, where our goal is to change the way you practice dentistry by helping you achieve clinical, financial, and personal balance. Now, here's your host, T-Bone. All right, everyone. Welcome back. I've been on a little bit of a hiatus. I know you guys have been getting episodes, but uh, I kind of record four or five in a row and then I take a little break and it, it's hard for me to get back in the groove of things. But I want to thank you all. And again, before we start, I want to say thank you and uh, ask you three favors. If you really enjoy the podcast, you know, they're totally free. They're, they're the one thing I do in my life that actually costs me money. I don't make anything. That and my kids. I mean, so far they're negative as well. <laughs> but um, if you could do me three favors, uh, one is if you could go on to iTunes and leave us a review for the podcast, that would be fantastic, an honest one. Number two, if you could subscribe to the podcast, that would be great. And number three, if you could help us by sharing your podcast on your social media venues or to your friends, dental friends, that would be unbelievably awesome. Uh, let's get into our conversation today. We will be talking with Dr. David Giuliani, who uh, happens to be a pseudo friend of mine. Uh, it's hot and cold to anybody that could be a friend of mine, to be quite honest with you. David is in Rochester, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. So it's a Detroit metro area. And so I want to welcome in David. David, what's up, bud? All right, in IT. You know, I got to be honest with you. I was my life has been a little bit this this has been a odd month. Uh, you know, I went on I went on a trip to Europe and then I came back and worked and we went to San Diego for spring break and then I just came back to work today and my clock is all off. I mean just way off. Like I couldn't go to bed till like two o'clock last night and I actually took a nap and had to set an alarm to wake up for our interview. <laughs> well, and actually, I've been following it on Facebook. So, yeah, um, trust me, if you think it's challenging being one of your friends, you should be in our position. It's just as much of a challenge. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a friend with me, to be honest with you. So, David, let me start by this. Is Detroit the hellhole that we think it is still? Or has it, you know, they say it's coming back. Has it come back? What is the deal with, li like, I couldn't imagine living in the Detroit area. Talk to me about well, that. Know, you know, it's funny you ask that. And everywhere I go, and, you know, obviously 30 to 40 events a year, everybody asks me that. And I think no matter how you feel about mainstream media, they really did a number on Detroit like 10 years ago. It it never hit rock bottom like they portrayed. I mean, some of those pictures they were shown were from the 70s. So it never got as bad as everybody thought. And it recovered so much quicker. I mean, the city's thriving right now. We got a we got a great new governor in, in the state. We have a great mayor. You guys get a good mayor? <laughs> yeah. So obviously, you know, it's amazing how well a city can do if you get rid of the corrupt guy that's stealing millions of dollars from well, the city. Well, I mean, no, 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 no. But li listen, let, let me clarify that. And I don't want to be too political today. It's not that you got rid of a, you just got a less corrupt person. Well, yeah, you know, I would say he's not nearly as – it was homegrown. I mean, this is the guy who would just robbed the city blind. We all, Everybody thought he was going to do great. He grew up in the city, college football star. You know, people thought he was going to do great. I think he's in prison in Texas somewhere now, I mean, for all the corruption and the money he stole. So, you know, when it hit rock bottom, it was bad, and, you know, it took a lot of good investors like Dan Gilbert. Who owns yeah, from the, the Cleveland Denver. Cavaliers. Yeah, so he's from Michigan. He's a Michigan State guy. Go Spartans. Obviously, that's right. I, I heard that he stuff. invested or Citibank invested like 100 million or more. So, yeah. So Dan Gilbert and then the Illich family. So Dan Gilbert owns the Cavaliers. The Illich family owns the Red Wings and the Tigers. And then the Carmanos family owns the Carolina Hurricanes. They own literally 90 percent of the office space in Detroit. They're throwing a lot of money down there. You know, young families are moving back in. There's a ton of growth and development. I mean, literally to see it. I don't think it'll ever be Chicago, but to see like Nike open up down there, Under Armour, Moose Jaw, it, it's really starting to... Moose Jocks? Moose Jaw, the, <laughs> the, the retail store. Yes, Moose Jocks. <laughs> we need a lot of Moose Jocks here. <laughs> you know, I'm just... Why would you have anything with the store name, anything with Moose in it? Moose Jaw. They sell winter gear. Now, up here in the north, we need winter gear, like, you know, winter clothing and, and camping gear, dude. I don't know what the hell you guys do. In camping. Carolina. Listen, yeah. let me tell you, here's the only way I'll buy any camping gear. If there's a button that you press and the tent pops up, 
and a button you press and the tent goes down. Otherwise, because I, I, I don't do manual labor. I just don't do it. Well, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of it, but at least they're a good retailer heading downtown. Actually, the Red Wings are building a huge new stadium. The Pistons are moving it's back It's going to be the Moose Jaw Stadium? It, actually, it's Little Caesars Arena because the Illich family <laughs> Like Pizza Pizza? Caesar. Yeah, because Little Caesars is owned by the Illich family. So, oh, yeah, Detroit's God. doing great. The suburbs How long has it been doing great? Probably Five years? Last, ten years? Three years. Three to four years. It's okay. Been, it's so it's just totally. doing it. Okay. So, like, so when you talk to somebody like me who's in the Triangle area of North Carolina – you know, we've been doing well for like, how about this? Our worst times are probably our times in 2008, 2009 are probably good times for, for many, many cities in the, uh, in the country. Sure. Without a doubt. Like definitely the auto industry took a hit. Does that but, come back? Oh, without a doubt. And actually, you know, Ford really did a nice job holding firm. They didn't take any federal money. GM and Chrysler reorganized and they really I mean, if you look at them stock wise, they're all up. And well, they're not as worth as much as Tesla. Well, obviously, what is? You know, I'm, I don't own a Tesla. You know, you know what we have on every corner in Michigan? A Ford Fix or Repair yeah. Daily. No gas stations. So we don't need to freaking <laughs> charge our car for a mile to get to a supercharger. I don't think you can buy a Tesla in Michigan. I don't think there are any dealers. Actually, actually, they they may not be. Actually, it might be one of the states where they can't. So, how long have you been in Rochester? Since 1997. So, and I did you grow up there? Nope, I grew up north of here in Midland, Michigan. Michigan, okay, so you're a Michigan guy. A Michigan guy, went to Michigan State undergrad, went to the University of Detroit for dental school. I did a GPR in the Air Force, uh, 93 to 94 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And then I was stationed at the Air Force Academy um, from 94 to 97. And then got out and moved back here and started my practice. Did you start from scratch? I did. I was working as an associate in another office. You didn't buy a practice? You literally just started from scratch? Yeah, I was working as an associate and started from scratch. In 1997. 1997. All right. Yeah. And and I know we're going to talk about this, but you just built – how long have you been in your new office now? A year and a half? One, one year. One we year. Moved, I, like actually May 9th will be the first – that will be our one-year anniversary when we open. So, so 1997 yeah. until 2016. Yeah. Okay. So let's call it 2006, mid 2016 to 2017. You're in your new office, and your new office compared to your old office is drastically different. Completely different. Yeah. And from 97 to 2016, were you in the same office? No, we were in a small startup. Like when I first built, I had three ops. I only I started from scratch, built it in a strip mall. How long were you in that? So I was there for seven years. I had so, two so chairs until 2004. Like two Yep, to 2004. In and three op strip mall? Yeah. Okay, and then 2004 through 2016? Yep, 12 years. I, I moved to a five op um, professional building where we kind of built out from, you know, we we bought a small practice when we made that move, a retiring guy in town. Oh, so you so, merged? Yep. As I moved in, I bought him out because he was getting ready to retire. We doubled our space at that point, we went from like 1,200 to 2,600 square feet. Five ops, you know, two high, three, kind of two and a half to three hygiene, two doctors, depending on the day. Did you Certain think, it, do you think you needed to merge to, uh, to grow your practice? Uh, no, it was a guy that I looked at going in with an, as an associate. And he basically, I bought 900 patients and $300,000 worth of revenue for $80,000. Okay. Like $80, for the practice. Huh? Is, do you think you could find something like that today? No, never. No. Not at all. He had no, obviously no debt. He was retiring. His practice, the equipment was out of the 70s and 80s. And he had so he was just buying the patient debt. charts, basically, the goodwill. Basically. Yeah. And so he didn't even have a panel. So literally in the first year, we did almost $300,000 in panels on those 900 patients. I mean, we just, you know, amazingly so, you know, on 200 and some, you know, $135 on a you know, on a, on a panel, we, we did a ton of money on panels and just x-rays and keeping up with everything. And, you know, just preventative care, fluoride. And How did you find this practice? He offered me an associateship when I was first coming in, but it wasn't busy enough. So, you know, once a year I'd have lunch with him and just told him, hey, when you're ready to sell, let me know. So I just kept up with him. So, so you're talking I, about in 1997, you were considering associating with him. And then in 2004, you bought him out. I bought him out. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. different was his practice from your practice? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, night and day. I mean, he had no technology, no understanding of technology. He was still casting his own gold crowns 
in 2003, waxing up his own. You know, he just basically he was kind of ahead of his time, like in the mid 90s. He totally dumped Amalgam and went to composites. And he was sort of ahead of the time that way, but still was practicing, you know, with gold and was casting and waxing up his own work. You know, he was only doing, you know, $295,000 when I bought him on literally five days a week, you know, 50 weeks a year. He never yeah, but he had probably money. like a 20% overhead. Yeah, exactly. And he was still bringing home like 180 grand. Yeah, I mean, he had like a 25% overhead. All right. Yeah. So you were out of space and you needed to expand anyway. In 2004, this merging opportunity came along. So you decided that I'm going to merge and expand and kill two birds with one stone. Correct. Okay. And that turned out to be a good thing for you. Great thing. Okay. Us. So did your practice go up by 300 or much more than 300? Much more than that. So what happened is just the additional revenue from, I mean, at the time, what we thought was technology, basically, which was not even digital. I mean, it was just a, a basic panel made the revenue go up. And then, you know, kind of in introducing these guys to modern dentistry, you know, at the time, you know, PFMs and some of the new ceramics that were coming out. So we took that literally $300,000 and in the first year did five from him. Okay. So on top of our practice. So we really grew. And you bought it unbelievably cheap anyway. So for, yeah, for 80,000. Yeah. Okay. It was phenomenal. All right. So let me ask you this. Okay. So like I've looked at merging practices and, and let's say, let's say I've in the past, not anytime recently, because I have a very different view of merging now than I did earlier. I was unbelievably fearful that bringing in a declining or outdated practice into mine that I would lose a significant amount of the patients because I may overwhelm them or they may not like it. I mean, did you find that to be the case with the 900 patients that you bought? Yeah, I was actually worried about that, but we found it to be exactly the opposite. Like they were loyal beyond belief to him, but when they were introduced to what at the time was modern dentistry, I mean, they were unbelievably open to it. Like just the thought of whitening, which he didn't do, just the thought of quadrant dentistry and, in, in, you know, on a day to day basis, ceramics and surgeries that we could do and the you know, obviously he was referring out like implant restorative work and he was just not really keeping up with what dentistry had become. So they were just amazed to be able to keep it all in house. He was referring out all of his endo. He was referring out all of his extractions. So they were just thrilled to have somebody a little younger with some energy in it that was introducing him. So I found them totally different and open to it. It was the exact opposite. Did he stick around when you bought merged the practice? Yeah, the agreement was he would stick around for three years, but he had about two years. As you can tell, I got this three-year fetish, I guess. But he tore a rotator cuff at like six. Did you tear it for him? <laughs> yeah, he was out in about 18 months um, to two years. That long? So, yeah, 18 to two months. He was a great, like he was like a Walmart greeter. Basically, he'd come in, shake hands, introduce the patients. And we had so many referrals from those people that the practice really, really grew. And he was he was well liked in town. He was a good guy, and that's the key in that merger, to find that loyal patient base that's really longing to to update their dental care. And the great thing about it was there was so much work in in those patients' mouths that, I mean, you could have thrived on that. I could have bought that practice for eighty grand and probably turned it into six hundred, you know, in the first year, literally. Okay, so all right, so now we're probably so two thousand four. You merged. You went to a new place. And then so now, so you're, you're still by yourself as a dentist a couple of years later, basically. Correct. We started to outgrow the practice. And even those five chairs, we started to outgrow where your hygiene you know, needs, just based on sheer numbers, were bigger than the, uh, the physical space we needed. You know, if you start to get, you know, 2,000 patients, you need 4,000. And that's if everybody's healthy. 4,000 appointments a year. I mean, you start doing the math and you don't even have the clinical time to see the patients that show up or that need you. So we were slowly outgrowing space. We were adding hygiene on certain days and that was compromising access to me because I was losing a chair. I started to get busy, obviously, on the lecture side of it and I was on the road more. So that's when we realized, hey, I need to start thinking associate. You need to start thinking more space and more hygiene. Okay. So when did associate come into the picture? What year? So my first associate came in in like 2008, 
Okay. Yeah. So you bought this practice in two. I, I, I keep going back to timelines just to keep everything. Yep. So seven years, you started from scratch, three operatory strip mall. 2004, you merged a practice. You went to five operatories in a professional building. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the older guy stuck around for basically 18 months, the Walmart greeter, <laughs> your own words, yeah, not exactly. mine, uh, stuck around for 18 months. Uh, so about 2006, he, he was gone. Okay. Yeah. And then by, so for 2006, 2007, then 2008, you ran the practice by yourself. Correct. Okay. What made you decide that you wanted to uh, help? We were we were getting overloaded and I was starting to add time onto my day. Like my 10 to six day was becoming eight to seven mm -hmm. just so people had access to me. And you were getting busier and busier where you knew you couldn't keep up that schedule at the same time. You know, obviously my outside life started to get busier um, as we were doing, you know, stuff outside for technology. We, I found myself out of the office more, which required, care and coverage and so that's when i thought about my first associate hey listen i want to go back a second i'm sorry yep. i do mean to interrupt talk to that's me about your practice okay are you fee for service are you insurance based i can't imagine you're not somewhat insurance based in michigan with so many unions and car you know the car industry and so forth but uh talk to me about that right so i we participate with two insurance plans right now which is uh, delta premier Okay. And Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So is Delta Premier the good Delta or the shitty Delta? That's the really, really good one we're about to all lose down the line. So in Michigan, because of the auto industry, they've kept it around. A lot of states have gotten rid of it. So I guess I'm fee for service because we only participate with two traditional <laughs> plans. <laughs> but you're in network for those plans. Correct. So how can so, you call yourself fee for service? Well, then I'm right. fee for service too. <laughs> Right. The funny thing is the UCR fees for those are still pretty good. Sure, but the, you're still in network. Still you in know. network. Okay. So unfortunately, just recently, they're not appointing any more Delta Premier providers. So as my associates have come in, we my last one, we were forced to start accepting Delta PPO. And what they did is they, they appointed her Delta Premier because I was already Delta Premier. But her reimbursement on Delta Premier is lower but her PPO reimbursement is higher. So there's a middle ground there. How do you keep um, track of this crap? It, yeah, it's getting really hard to the point where I'm probably just out of sheer necessity going to have to start accepting the PPO on my side also because it's getting really hard. And patients who have PPO that see me get obviously a little pissed off if they're like, well, wait a minute, I could have seen the other doctor and saved hundred dollars. Yeah, and then you should say, yes, go see the other doctor. But I want to come back to that. Like, I want to yeah. come back to that. Okay. Yeah. So I, I love this misnomer and I, I'll make fun of you for that. As you say, I'm, I'm fee for service except the two plans I participate in, which happen to be the two biggest plans in the entire state, which probably make up a decent percentage of your practice. Well, you can actually <laughs> delete that if you'd like. I, you know, yes, I guess. I'm not deleting anything. We don't do any editing, but. Yeah, that's why you suck. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's kind of funny though. I, I haven't had to follow and head down the PPO road yet, but it's inevitable. But you're in the PPO road. What are you talking about? You um, take Delta Premier and you take Blue Cross Blue Shield. You're a PPO dentist. Do you think so? D are you in network? I participate with the blue. So we have Blue Cross PPOs and we have Delta PPO where the UCR is so much lower. No, 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 but that's not my point. My point is to me, you're a PPO dentist if you are in network with an insurance company and yeah. their fees are different from your UCR, like even by $1. Okay. Then yes, you're right. You're right. We are, we are a PPO. <laughs> well, yes, then yes. Then we can argue and, and debate the, the I guess the day to day definition of traditional. So, so let me ask you this: What percentage of your patients have Delta Premier or Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan? We're probably slightly under fifty percent. Okay, so listen to this, David. Okay, what you're telling me is you're trying to argue with me that you're not a PPO practice when just under fifty percent of your patients have one of these plans that you participate with. Yeah, I guess when you start talking about it that way, I guess most of us draw the line at the PPO title. You know so I mean? just so how about this? What if we called it Delta, not PPO? Would you say, I mean, but it's still a plan you participate with. 
Correct, but I like the not PTO plan. How's that sound? No. Um, the reason I the reason I laugh about this, okay, and the reason I, I, I want to bring it up is there is this stigma that being in network or being an insurance dentist, and, and see this really helps bring my point in, okay? Is that being in network or being a PPO dentist precludes you from doing great dentistry or precludes you from having the best technology? And I would say you have better and more technology than I do. Correct. And I actually I totally agree with that, T. I, I don't think that um I think your practice, obviously, as you as yours is developing, is exactly what you make it. You can do any dentistry with any plan that you want, without a doubt. And I I don't think whether I never thought the PPO side of it was something I didn't want to dive into. I just feel that if we're going to dive into it, my I have to be organized for it because early on, without help, I felt that I was going to be doing, let's say, more volume in basic dentistry to make up for the loss of the UCR percentages we were going to be collecting from what Premier paid for the PPO. And the difference is sometimes 20 to 25% on a crown. So if, I mean, we're getting reimbursed pretty well on our Delta Premier stuff, but the PPO stuff is, is sometimes 20% lower. So in my mind, I would just have to up my volume, which I have no problem doing if you bring in the right associates and you have the right setup to do. We just haven't, I haven't mentally made that jump yet because I don't really want to work more and I really don't want to work harder. Okay. So then why are you, why are you taking these plans? So you're saying have my, just my associates take them? Yes. You know, that's what we did. Um, I personally dropped MetLife. Our practice did not. Okay. And then, so that was the first experiment because MetLife accounted for a, a north of slightly north of a third of my patients. So that, that's a pretty big leap for me to do that. And we have seen absolutely zero, zero pushback. Uh, so now I so totally insurance-driven patients. Uh, we'll just say, you know, Dr. A is not in MetLife. You can see Dr. XYZ at the practice, and uh, he or she participates with the insurance, and that's your choice. So what happens for me is, because you're right, you have the same, you and everybody else listening, if you're the practice owner of what I call the senior doc, that doesn't mean old, okay? It just means that you're the person that put the money on the line to, to build the place. Um, you have the same problem. We have a time issue, okay? And, and the only way to make more in our practices right now is to work more. And for me, that's not the solution, right? And for me, the solution for you would be to get paid better on those things that you do, and and make yourself not needed in the practice as much. And the, one of the best ways of doing it is to drop insurance yourself, not your practice, just yourself on certain plans. And that way you can get paid more for those patients that choose to see you. Well, and that that's sort of how we're introducing some of those. Like I, yes, that's exactly how we're introducing them. And I think that's how we're going to keep our associates busy from the moment they get in there where you and i'm sure you have that you still have your traditional patients that just want to see of course you. and they're willing to pay now yeah and they're willing to exactly and I'm, I'm finding that like when i when i first brought in my first associate i was almost 14 or 15 weeks out for a two-hour appointment and yes and so now when you brought in an associate once they get started i found myself down to six or seven which was great which is horrible I, by the way you should only be booked out two weeks Right. Which I, but again, for me, that was cutting it in half. And I thought that was awesome. The next problem that happened is now we're slowly creeping up because as I told you, my associate seems to be caught in a, a loop of easier dentistry, which means these patients now want to come back and see, are, are starting to want to see me. And now my time is creeping up to 12, 13 weeks. So we need to look at another associate, getting those guys busy. And that's how we're going to introduce these other new plans is introduce patients through them. And then the patients that my current patients that have those plans can then go see them, get a financial situation and, and really be in a better position, you know. All right. So your pseudo FIFA service practice that I've crushed your dreams on now is not a FIFA service practice. Uh, where I'm, I'm too old for you to crush my dreams. <laughs> <All right>. uh, <laughs> let's talk about more about your practice for a second. If I were a patient in your practice, if I walked in the door, what what could I get done in your practice? Well, how, let me ask. Let me let me ask it a different way. I apologize. 
what would you have to, what would you refer me out for? What could I ask you? What could my needs be or ask you to do for me that you would say, you know what? I need to send you somewhere else. Like IV sedation for third molars. Okay. But okay. Now you said two things and I, and I hear two yeah. different things. Is it the IV sedation or is it the third molars or is it the combination of both? Um, well, I, yeah, let's just call it a combination of both. I do not have a lot of the monitoring equipment. I'm still IV and ACL certified, so we can do IV. In How, the when's office. the last time you did it? We bring in a nurse anesthetist. Okay. So, the last, so we can do that at any time. Um, we just we did that probably six months ago. Um, so we do that for large, large surgical cases where we're extracting and doing a lot of um, like sinus lifts and where the patients want to be sedated. So the only thing we really refer out is third molar extractions and – any heavy perio surgery. What where, about soft tissue grafting? I have recession. No, we would for yes, we would refer out most perio surgery, let's say, yeah. Like I would consider perio soft tissue and hard tissue stuff. Do you do like crown lengthening? Effect. Yeah, without a doubt. We'll do crown lengthening with the procedure if we need it. Okay. We, can I get a bone graft? Without a doubt, yes. Okay. So basically you're you're almost just like me in the sense that basically the things I refer out are a third molars, uh, and soft tissue procedures. Yeah. Yes. Without a doubt. Okay. All right. So I can get a molar root canal. Without a doubt. Yeah. Second molar root canal. Yes. Okay. I could get an implant, obviously. Yes. Can I get ortho? Yes. Adolescent yes. ortho. Yes. So you do interceptive orthodontics as well. I do. Okay, so that's that's ahead of me as well. So now I have to go to learn how to do that because I can't be below you. <laughs> that is now, do you do the interceptive orthodontics or does somebody else? No, I do. So okay. in, in the military, we, you know, they definitely in my GPR, you're kind of trained to do um, interceptive adult also because they stick you sometimes out of bases where there's no orthodontist. So if dependents have issues, you've got to be able to handle those. So how often do you do interceptive cases? At any given time, we probably have 30 total ortho cases going, and at least a third of them are, are interceptive, where even you know before you're doing, I guess, tray aligner treatment therapy, you might be doing some sort of expansion and, and, and or AP movement, without a doubt. Okay, so where, do you, where does one learn this from? So early on... In because I'm not going to the Air Force. Okay, so yeah, then I, you know, tons of, there are, <laughs> you could. I, I, I cannot. I'm not a citizen, so I couldn't go to the Air Force. But that's a different story. You're not a U.S. citizen. No, I was born um, in India. <laughs> get me started. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, anywhere. Look on the AAO, the American Academy of Orthodontics. Obviously, they'll have GP courses. Um, do you take continuing education in orthodontics? I I do. So a lot of my practices switched over to aligner therapy because I do believe it's way more efficient. And if you okay. do the interceptive right, you can get the movement correct. So you're doing rubber bands and things like that? Correct, With, yeah. When you say aligner, are you doing Invisalign? In, Invisalign, yes, primarily. Okay. Well, you use clear correct as well? I Yes, a little bit. I, I, I Yes. A Why, you hesitate? Bit. Why are you hesitating, David? Because I think clear correct's a great product, but I think Invisalign is a better product. It's a greater more. product way better yeah. and great. You know, you know what I laugh about? Um, I laugh about people that complain about the lab fee of Invisalign because I complain about it too. But the solution to it is, you know what I'll do is I will learn how to use software to uh, plan out my cases and then print models and create suck downs. And that will eliminate my Invisalign lab bill. And, and uh, I find that to be quite honestly I, I want to say almost stupid, but that's unfair for me to say, but it's, it's well, moronic again, in a way. Obviously, we have a lot of people doing that. Obviously, these digital printers are coming up. They're, I have, I, I totally agree with you. Again, I don't love spending $1,700 on an Invisalign case, but it depends what your fee is. I mean, think about that. You've got records. You've got a records appointment, which is 45 minutes in my office. You've got a delivery appointment with attachments, which my assistants do, and then you basically – see them every six to eight weeks, give them eight trays, do a little interpoxy. You're doing one-week aligner wear as well? 
We're doing one week aligner yeah, wear and you end up literally seeing these patients every eight weeks for a half an hour, a little IPR maybe, but my assistants are seeing the majority of them. We are at the point now with our Invisalign where your Invisalign overhead is literally 30%. That's yeah. it. You know, yeah. and, and my associates or my assistants do so much of it. If we hit our Invisalign goal monthly, I give my assistants $500 each. Okay. Because, wow. it, I mean, you make so much money off of Invisalign that, I mean, if you... If so you you're doing Invisalign teen as well? Yes. So let me ask you this. If, if I were a person that wanted to learn a lot more about doing this type of treatment with Invisalign, where, where would I go learn that? So talk to your local rep because the local reps, depending on how active they are, they have study clubs and podcasts and webinars on how to do this. The Invisalign, they do a summit, like they do a GP summit every other year. Do you go to these things? It's awesome. I I have not gone in the, to the last one, so I haven't been mm-hmm. in four years. But I love the Invisalign Summit because you can learn about class two corrections. You know, I don't do a lot of class three Invisalign. That's sure. probably the one bit of ortho I refer out. No, but there's got to there's got to be a limitation to everything that we do. There's a reason that they make specialists. Correct. And so class three is my limitation. I've gotten great results with class two. You get great. But you have to do elastics with class twos, correct? You do. You do. And expansion. You're, it's amazing what you can do with expansion in Invisalign now. The material is so Now, real good. expansion? You're talking about on teenagers? Real palatal expansion on them. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you catch that kid around 13, 14, you know, where they're almost at a puberty level, you can use the trays for maybe one to two millimeters of expansion. If you've got to do full, you know, five, six millimeters, you know, sometimes Invisalign says they can do it, but I'll, I'll go with a, a adjustable palatal expander so I can control it and it's fixed. And then do, then do, and then go to traditional. So it's like phase okay. one and phase two. Okay. And we adjust the fees accordingly. I didn't know this about you, did you David. Dude, this is, there's a lot of stuff you do, man. Maybe you should teach courses on this shit. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe 3D Dennis needs somebody yeah. to teach an ortho course. Yeah, I, well, I can tell you we, we do, actually, because uh, yeah. uh, our, my goal on the 3D Dennis stuff is to provide training for people that want to grow and expand their practice. Um, and ortho is an area that, uh, quite honestly, I'm deficient in. And, uh, you know, I essentially do adult relapse cases and that's it. In fact, I, I don't do any ortho. My, I let my, my current associate do all the orthodontics. All right. But anyway, back to, back to your timeline. I, I like the little, uh, the side, uh, uh, things here. So you are a quote unquote pseudo fee for service practice. <laughs> okay. You started in 97. In 2004, you merged the practice in, went from three ops to five ops. And then now let's get to 2008. You brought in your first associate. How many associates have you gone through in the last 10 years now? So I'm on my third. Okay. Uh, So the first one was kind of tragic. I mean, he was a classmate of mine. He was diagnosed with melanoma at 36. And so he was an associate ready to buy in on into the practice he was in here in town. Gets diagnosed with melanoma goes through treatment, the doc had to sell the practice, so he brought in another associate and sold it out from under him. He comes in as an associate in my practice, worked for two years. Un- unfortunately, he had a, re- a recurrence of it and passed away at 40. Wow. So that was 2010. Um, then I brought in another female at 2011, and I say that not in any other terms other than she um, – also decided family was important and had her third child, four, fourth child, and decided to cut back. So now I'm on my current. So I had her from like 2011 to 2013. And then I've had my last one for about two years now also. Have they been good good uh, relationships for you? The relationships have always been good. Um, they've never ended. I mean, I mean other than the other, they've <laughs> Never ended badly, except for the, the poor the guy. Death. Passed away. Yeah. yeah, except that one. And he was kind of a friend of mine through dental school. So that was hard. Um, it, it was always understood that we would try and keep the lines of communication open as much as possible and not let small things become big things. Um, so in that How way, much experience did they have when they came to you? Obviously, your classmate was as experienced as you, in a sense, age-wise. Correct. So my sec. So yeah, so he... You know, and experience is very, very much a broad term when you get to, he was 
you know, 14 years out like I was when I, he and I got together. But his experience was limited to a lot of GP stuff, like restorative, um, whether it's basic direct placed and crown and bridge. Um, he was not any type of a, a CAD CAM user at the time and uh, didn't do a lot of surgery. So he was what I would consider good at what he did. He was just restorative. He was a basic bread and butter meatball restorative exactly. dentist. Which there's nothing nothing wrong with that, but um, he wasn't, yes. So my second associate had seven years of experience in what was a Medicaid provided office. What was that like bringing that into your practice, into your well, pseudo fee for service practice? Uh, yeah, you know what? All my pseudo fee for service patients didn't understand them out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so. You know, treatment planning was rough because she was very much limited to a mindset that was Medicaid based. And yeah. why did you um, bring her in? So she had had a a step in the middle at a traditionally a more traditional non Medicaid based practice. So she w had a great personality. She seemed to want to get involved with more advanced type of treatment. She was referred to me through a friend, so I gave it a shot. And it's kind of funny that you said this. So she wasn't really evolving. And I kind of set some guidelines for these guys. You know, the first year, just kind of like get an understanding of how you want to work in this practice. So we take almost a year to just get your feet wet, feel the practice out, see what you want to do. The second year, let's get a philosophy of whatever you want to do, whether it's neuromuscular, whether it's occlusal based, let's, and then let's, let's really focus on where you want your dentistry to go in that second year. And then in the third year, we'll start talking buy-in if it all works. Well, at the end of the second year, she wasn't really progressing from an, like a technology standpoint. I offered to pay for some courses and I, we had a pretty big case coming up where we were going to, we had placed some implants guided. We were restoring them and we were doing the, you know, the abutments and the, uh, in the restorative side of it all through CAD CAM. At the end of that appointment, she literally looked at me and she said, not only do I think I can't do that, I don't want to do that, and I never want to learn how to do that. Well, that's not the end of the world. It, it's, it's not. So we said, well, what does that mean for you? Here's what I think it's going to limit you in the practice because you can do all the basic stuff. Um, she then found out she was pregnant. For all I know, she knew at that point, so that was the, the kind of kicker. And she said she wanted to cut back to two days, which was not going to help me. No, uh, that's that's probably non-negotiable. Right. So we then let her go. She bought a small practice um, and is, you know, doing the dentistry she wants to do. My current associate was a patient of the practice through dental school. I hired her right out of dental school, which I thought was a great idea because you could literally monitor. Mold. You can mold them. Yes. You can monitor and, and, and um, develop them. As they have no bad habits, they haven't gotten in any mental funk about what dentistry is about yet. And I honestly thought that by coming into my office, she only worked in the old facility for, gee, six months before we moved. Um, so she really has it well. I pay her well. And uh, she does really well, like I said earlier. But she's basically a, a bicuspidonist. I mean, she likes working in the interior she likes working in the middle of the mouth really well. Um, so we're, we're finding some limitations, and now we just found out she is also pregnant. Are you impregnating so, these people? I am not. <laughs> start asking me that. Uh, but no, none of these Wait, so I'm not the only one that's asked you this? No, none of these children are mine. That's good. Um, have, you, have you had Jerry Springer paternity tests? <laughs> I, I have not yet, and I refuse to take one. Um, yeah. Okay. So the good news is none of these children are mine, thank God. That you're aware of. That I am aware. That I am aware of. I don't know what happens while I fall asleep and take a nap in my office, but uh, I, I can physically have no recollection of impregnating anybody. How's that sound? Okay. I'm All not right. even sure my own kids are mine certain days. God help us. All right. So let's let's pop into this office, this office you built in 2016. All right. Because what? when you told me about this, I thought you were absolutely nuts. I didn't tell you this. Because my wife told me that I can no longer tell people how I feel. I have to keep it to myself. <laughs> Some of us, I, I think it's refreshing, but I'm sure most people are offended by your, <laughs> your inane thoughts about their day-to-day -day life, I'm sure. Uh, my, 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 what I tell people is, why do you tell me this? Because I can't keep quiet. So not, my, my judgments of you are not my fault. It's, your, <laughs> it's what you're doing to make me judge you. That is the problem. Exactly. Right? So you decided... To build this 
unbelievably state-of-the-art practice. So you went from what sounds like 2,500 square feet, five operatories, uh, in 2015, 16, you moved into this new office. Now talk to me about this new office. Right. So we were running out of space. I couldn't figure out if I wanted seven or nine apps. So I settled in on seven, four dental treatment rooms, three hygiene. Um, we had settled. Uh, we looked at all the manufacturers of dental equipment and almost agreed to terms on an ADAC package, to be perfectly honest with you. We, went, we were at Zero World, obviously, in 2015. So, CERC 30. CERC 30. You're right. Yeah, CERC 30. Um, when they released the, uh, the Serona treatment centers here in the U.S., and I was waiting for ADAC's new package to come out because they were promising a total change in the way the office and operatory flow was going to be. And basically, it was slightly different, but really not a lot of technological advances that I was looking for in the integration to make my operatories more the center of what I needed to do for any patient at any time. So I literally, when they released these treatment centers, my rep, my equipment specialist just happened to be at CERC 30 because it was in, um, I don't know why he was covering it for Patterson, but he was. So it's I Vegas, my that's why. Then. <laughs> Yeah, everybody was Vegas, you're right. So he had, we'd gone out to ADAC, we'd settled on that 500 package. Um, but when I saw the treatment centers, I knew immediately when they were up on stage. Yeah, that and, 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 and since you're a Serona fanboy, as am I. Yes. So how much more expensive were these Serona chairs compared to what you were doing or the Serona package? You know, you have to look apples for apples. Oh, so here we go. It, all right. So, yeah, in every one of my dental treatment rooms, in the dock rooms, we have Seric capabilities. So I have two Teneos and two Integos, all with Seric in the operatories. So we moved it from the rolling cart to the chair side unit. So you don't have the, the, the ACs anymore. Correct. We have no more mobile carts. Um, and so we now have Seric capabilities at any time in all four rooms simultaneously. So I, my two Teneos fully integrated with Seric and with endo with implant and with the cameras and the ultrasonics you're talking probably a buck 40 140 grand a chair for the so, operatory for the operatory now yeah. adex adex 500 you're probably talking about and then 50 that's, yeah you're talking 50 to 60 but you throw a seric unit in those rooms no and, that's totally yeah absolutely yeah your your apples are, you can go ahead and laugh at my apples for apples PPO traditional. Sure, yeah, right. No, no, I mean it's not. In the right. end, at the end of the day, when you consider implant, motor, endo unit, all that nonsense, apex locator built in. I mean, right. it, it's these chairs. They're expensive, but they're not. If you're the practice that has all that stuff or needs to have all that stuff, it, it's not. It's not a significant premium. It's a, still a premium, uh, but it's not a significant premium. Correct. And so I, I knew these were the right systems for me based on what my needs were to were. What I wanted to do with my practice, because being out of the office as often as I am, I, I needed to be efficient when I'm there. And what we found happening is, and you know the look, T, like if you have an endo exposure when you're prepping for a crown, you know, you look at your staff and they're looking at you and, and their heads are shaking and they're like, son of a Gun. bitch, we've yeah. got a 20 minute turnaround to get endo out here, to get an endo motor out, to get the oven out, to get everything out. It takes 15 to 20 minutes to get a room ready. So we were finding we were either referring these people out or stopping what we were doing, closing them up and rescheduling. Which, which only makes, makes it worse, by the way. Which makes it worse. So we were not as efficient as we could be. So now, literally, if I have an endo exposure, I, we, we put on an endo handpiece. And while I'm accessing, somebody gets out an oven. That's it. I mean, it takes. But because um, your apex locator is built in. Apex locator is built in. You, you clip it on. And that's usually there anyway. So you are literally in and out. I can do an endo on a crown while the crown is literally milling. Milling, yeah. Endo. Yeah. yeah, Apex. And I, I, and I now trust the Apex locator explicitly. We do take x-rays, but usually if the Apex locator says I'm there, that's where I stop. I quickly take a film just to check it, and, and we're good. I, I know we're good. And with it, the Teneos are set up for my endo system, which is I use, I use wave one gold mm -hmm. and you're in, you're out. I mean, literally one file per canal. And, and not only is it per, it's not just set up. I think what, because I, you know, look, for pure disclosure, I'm purchasing two Teneos. I'm actually buying them. I, I don't get any discounts or anything like that. Um, but 
it's set per file. So it knows the torque, it knows the speed, it knows the sequencing, it knows everything for these files. I mean, it's, and it, and my understanding, David, and correct me if I'm wrong, is they're not limited to just uh, the Densply files. You can do all the other files with it as well, correct? Correct. Whatever system it is now. So the with the Wave 1 in the Densply, the thing was the reciprocating software just got added, but everything else that's pure rotary. It was so you could do broken. rotary, you could do reciprocation. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. can do everything. Anything. Yeah, you, you sure can. Okay. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So it, it's phenomenal. I, I do. I, I love every minute of it. And it, it's me. Were you scared? More- okay. So how much money did you, how big is your office now? Besides it being in fact, the seven operatories, how square feet so is square, it? Square, we're at 4,200. So, we we have a lot of space. Are you in a standalone building? No, and that was the key. I was looking for standalone to start with, and the one thing they don't make in my city anymore, and the, you know, you hear that story. The one thing they don't make anymore is dirt. So I looked at multiple options, like buying a building, tearing down and building, buying land and building, and I am in a professional condo space, so I'm on the second floor. I bought the space, but it's a condo, and that was sort of the most. Believe it or not, even though the numbers sound horrible, it was the most financially, like fiscally. Yeah, but you weren't paying rent anymore. Because, yeah, I'm not paying rent. But at the same time, you know, you were looking at buying a lot that was an acre and building. You were looking at a million and a half in my area to do that. Mm -hmm. I was able to get in, buy the 4,200 square feet and build it out for 850. Okay. So how much money do you have in this new office, if you don't mind sharing? 2.25 2.25 million. I know the number exactly. 2.254 million, to be honest with you. And what did that include? That included everything. That included the the land, the real estate, the equipment, yeah. everything. So it was it was a it was a, a flat box. So that was real estate, architecture, build out. We were in at 900. Okay. So so we were in at 900 to get the walls built and the mechanicals brought in and up there you know what i mean like mm-hmm. uh, sure. like to each room then we're in for about um a million in dental equipment like okay. chairs and chairs cabinetry chairs, all that stuff cabinetry. you know we have a brand new customized sterilization center with you know two obviously two autoclaves two statums it's all auto fill and auto drain um all capillary cabinets from serona and or from Densply, starting now, and everything is new. We brought absolutely nothing. We switched over to a cassette system. The only thing I brought, T, and I've been doing this now. I graduated in '93, so I've been doing this 24 years. The only thing I brought was my rolling AC unit, my blue cam, which we still have floating around because I do still train on that a little bit because people still have it, and we brought my my XG3D. We literally sold everything else, every every instrument. Um, we brought some, obviously, sundries and supplies day to day, but I bought all new instruments, all new. We switched to a cassette system. So I've got about a million in Serona stuff, and then I've got about 400,000 in, in other new variables, like a compressor, um, new vacuum. Um, I mean, basically, you built a brand new practice. It, it, yes. And if I would have done this 10 years ago, I never would have been able to afford to just throw it all out and start over. But by waiting to this point, I the practice was in a position where... How long did it take you to go from A to Z with this? From the conception to... Like, when did you start thinking, that, hey, I need I need a monstrosity? Not that it's a monstrosity. I it, mean, was, it was almost three years from okay. I got to move to finding the space. We, we had our, you know, we had our hooks into two other real estate locations that either didn't appraise out um, or... They weren't compromising on them. I mean, we we lost real estate ventures by getting outbid on some stuff. Um, you know, you it just didn't work out. Yeah, things like, happen. I, yeah, I kept coming back to the condo so, because it still came. It was still there. In fact, it did not appraise out the first time. It fell apart, so I walked away. They came back to me and, and conceded and made some concessions on the price down to the appraisal, and then we made the agreement. Okay, what? And I'm asking this in a serious way. Okay. Um, so 24 years, 22, so we're talking about 21 years in, okay? Yep. You've done well, you have a good practice, you have a family, you know, what possesses someone to make, uh, because I'm not quite there, okay? But let, let's pretend I'm going to be there in a few years. 
Um, what possesses you to take such a risk at that at that time frame and that age? And and how do you do it? I mean, how do you mentally say, "Hey, I'm I'm ready to do this." Right. Well, you know what's funny is that because you have more to lose twenty two years in than you did at one year in. Right. And obviously, you worry about the return on your investment at that point, um, and you are really calculating those numbers. And I would say, to me, it was never a risk because I knew exactly what my budget was going to be. I knew exactly what I could afford. I knew exactly what my my personal expenses are going to be. How did you know what you could afford? Um, so what happened is I, I took a look at – the research in dental practices. So you have to look at your practice and I know my numbers and I'm a pretty, I mean, you've known me a long time. I'm a very OCD person. I'm type A to the hilt. So on a day-to-day basis, I know my overhead. And basically if the average world, right, in dental practices, the average practice in this country is operating at $675,000 in revenue a year at 75%, right? So if you think about that number, you can't even afford barely to fund your retirement. If you're thinking 25 percent, uh, you're of better that, off being an associate. You're, yeah, exactly. So your numbers have to justify what you're doing. So in my office, if you want to hear the numbers, I'll sure. let you know. When I decided to do this, we were collecting one point eight million on about 62 percent overhead. That's pre so, pre doctor compensation. That's pre-doctor compensation. So not you or the associate? Um, that included the associate's compensation because on my P&L, she goes down on as, as a, a Okay, so let's call that pre-owner compensation. Correct. So I was running at about 38% profit. But no, but that's not, that's not true because you didn't pay yourself. I hadn't paid myself yet. So okay. the practice – so let's just say the practice had an annual um, – allowance that I could dive into at about 38% of the 1.8 million. And nobody's going to take all that money out anyway, right. right? We all have, we all have our number that we like to keep our checking account at. So what I did was I, I started to do some numbers and I said, okay, what happens if I just become the normal guy and I let my overhead run up to 75% and I don't, and I plan a year that and we have no growth for the rest of my life, right? So I'm I'm 25% of the 1.8 million dollars, which when you think about that, that's still four hundred thousand dollars of cash, right? Right. Of income. So and so I'm at a point where I'm I mean to be honest with you, I'm almost fifty. My retirement obviously nobody's one hundred percent funded, but my kids' college was saved for. My retirement is doing fine. I don't have a lot of personal expenses. So I figured I could I could live on 20, 18 to 20% of that $1.8 million as my salary if everything in the world stayed the same. I didn't grow. I didn't, we didn't see any, you know, any increase in patient flow. Nothing good happened. So that's what I balanced it out at. So the difference in what my budget was, was that 13%. So I just figured that 13% between 75 and 62% 62% turned out to be almost $17,000 a month. And that was my, that was my budget. Okay. So you so followed that. And what, what has your practice done since you moved in now? Yep. So I, I ran all that by my account and he was good with it. And I was a finance major in college. So the numbers made sense to me. Um, so I, I didn't even plan growth and we were flat until we moved in. We ended up last year at 217 so we were up literally 300 grand, 300 grand, which offset the whole cost of the build. So I saw no. And right now we are running, believe it or not, in the new office after spending two million dollars, that growth, we are running so much more efficiently. I'm running at 64 percent overhead, trending to probably two point six this year. OK, so 64 percent overhead pre-owner compensation. Pre-owner compensation. So here, here's one thing I'd ask you to do, David, and this is my suggestion to you. Okay, I think you got to pay yourself like an associate. Okay, so my my belief in dental overhead is that your overhead needs to account for replacing yourself. So uh, if like I believe in at least in North Carolina, uh, typical dentist compensation is thirty percent of collections. 
in, in personal collections, right? So my goal, and I'm not there yet, my goal is to run my practice at an 80% overhead, including all compensations whatsoever. So I want to net 20% as a business owner. Uh, that's my goal. I'm at about half of that right now. Uh, half, I'm at about 12, 12%, okay? So what I would encourage you to do is to, uh, and anybody listening, is to set your sights at 80% overhead, including total compensation of the dentist. And, and the reason I want to do that is, is that allows you to realize how much budget you have to replace yourself. So you can buy your time. You can buy yourself out of your practice in a way. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to buy some time out of the practice. And I know that uh, budget-wise we can do it because uh, I pay myself 30% of collections, just like any associate. So if it takes me one or two or three dentists or one or one and a half dentists to replace me, it's just a line item shift from paying myself to paying somebody else. What are your thoughts on something like that? Oh, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, when I add in, so I, I pay myself a flat amount every month. Yeah, but you need not, to pay yourself a percentage because you couldn't right. hire somebody else to replace you and pay them a flat amount. Right. And I, you know, it's kind of funny. I've never looked at it that way. I'm kind of the guy that, you know, I take out the money I need, the money I feel I want to. So I really only pay my, you know, I totally only pay myself like you, probably 15% of what the revenue is. As a business so, owner. As a business owner. I'm right. paying myself probably 15 But that's, and again, I think sometimes you're right. If I were to take that 20%, that's just more money you put away, more money you save. Right. But, but what I'm like, saying is, is, is as a business owner, you have a profit margin. Okay. Correct. So, so for me as a dental practice owner, I, I don't consider when you say to me, my overhead is 62% pre-owner compensation. I, I don't, I don't find that to be a reasonable number because somebody's got to pay you. Or let's say you went on a sabbatical for two years and Correct. you found somebody, you found David Giuliani twin, you would have to pay that person a percentage. Correct. Correct. So, so my question is, is what can you, what, you know, and this is a rhetorical question, you know, what can you make as a business owner in your practice? So in other words, I mean, the, the point should come where you should say, you know what, I can walk away and I'm still going to make 10, 12, 15, 20, 25%, whatever it is for the goodwill I've created in my practice Yeah. by just yeah. running it. Well, that's a great thought. And I, I yes. And I, I guess none of us want to look at that day where we, because I mean, Sorry, maybe, why don't you, you should I, want to. Right. And I mean, at some point you just hopefully turn the keys over and walk no, away. But, but see, think, but that's the whole point of it, David is, is okay. L l well, I, I don't want to get into that necessarily, but the point of it is, is maybe sometimes it doesn't make sense to sell your practice because most of us are selling a practice at 60%, six, zero, 60 to 70% of revenue. Yep. Correct. Okay, yep. and let's say in a perfect world, you have a 20% margin as an owner after compensation. Yep. That's three years. Yeah. So if you literally stopped working and held on to your practice for three years and were able to replace yourself with one, one and a half, two dentists, that, that would be silly to sell three years early. Right. Because you'll make the same amount of money as a business owner. And the other thing I like about it is, is it allows you to really know what you're able to spend and what your budget is and what your margin is. Because in my mind, you took a $2 million investment and I want to get a return on my $2 million, uh, not as a dentist. Because you can, in theory, if you could go somewhere else and work and produce like you're producing now, they're going to pay you anywhere from 25 to 35%, depending on what area of the country you're in. They're going to pay you 30% typically. So I want to know what, what investment you're making on your risk. Uh, that you're taking it. Obviously, you're making an investment there, but that that's how I mentally look at it from a pure business perspective. But right. just food for and thought. I, I guess I haven't thought about that. I never thought about that that exit strategy to exit earlier, replace yourself, mm -hmm. and still. I, I guess I've never, like most dentists, I don't think. I, but you I, have right. to be. You, you need to be. Right. You you just like me need to be, David, because because. You know, so now, 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 now let me, okay, so we've talked a lot about your practice. That's unbelievable. So now let me give you some of my thoughts, okay, on what I'm hearing from you, okay? So this is where I'm going to give you a little bit of a hard time, okay? 
Uh, and as a friend, I can do that. Okay. Did you? Was there a time limit to this thing? Aren't we done? <laughs> there, there is, but uh, but I make the rules. So, uh, um, nice. all right. So let me ask you this: Why do you do fillings? Um, that's a really great question. I I, I haven't thought twice about that. I, I do fillings because patients need. And okay, again, so I short. understand. I, I don't. I know the term need. They need. So and you, desire. Your, your associates can't do fillings. Oh, cor- without a do- yes, I would love it if my associates did all the fillings. Okay, well, what, what's things. holding you back from doing that? Just stop. Just get another associate. Correct. Correct. We do a lot of quadrant based stuff. Sure, but still, nice but st- listen. No, I- you said it yourself. You make more. So let me ask you this: If you didn't have to do fillings, okay, and all that time was freed up for you, okay, could you do more ortho? without a doubt okay so so what you're telling me is that you're jumping over dollars to make pennies correct like most of us yes and and the patients talk me into doing their a lot of their fillings i'm so, like i can't you just do them yeah, yeah so the answer is no so like how about this today we had a lady come in and uh, uh she needs a single crown on tooth number 30 and quite frankly my team doesn't want me to do it because they know that hey i never say no to anything okay and they know that i have a finite amount of time in the practice so if they want to make their numbers, they need to either have me doing the right, the right things or they're not going to make the numbers, right? So they literally told her it'll be July before, wow. I, could do that, okay. before I could do that crown. And, and that's not necessarily the truth, but in a way it is because we're at a point where we're blo- mentally blocking out that I'm allowed to do. I'm allowed to do one filling per day. And that filling better be associated with something else. That's already like today I did a crown and a filling on somebody, right? So that, that filling was associated with doing that. So my question to you at 24 years in, why in the hell are you doing fillings? Okay. And, and, and because quite frankly, I think you're above it. Your skill set is unbelievable. Okay. I'm jealous. Okay. So my question is, is every time you do a filling, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. Okay. And if I asked you, what's the most enjoyable thing that you do in your practice, what would you say it is? What do you get the most, what would, if you walked in and this is all you did all day long, what would you say that would be unbelievable? What procedure would that be? Guided surgery. Okay, great. So stop doing filling so you can do more guided surgery because when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else, okay? And and you would spend, you would be better off cultivating hygiene and just doing hygiene checks and, and getting more people to accept treatment. You'd be better off focusing on your business to get more implant patients, uh, to go and make uh, visits to the unions or whatever it is and to your pseudo PPO, uh, employers. Uh, so, uh, so, and then my, then I would even go as far as saying for you, David, why, how can I get a single crown from you? Could I come to your practice and have David Giuliani do a single crown on tooth number 30 for me? Yes. Why? Um, because my associate only works on bicuspids. Um, okay, but that's a, that's, no, I- but this, but, yes. but it starts at the top, okay? Correct. It start it starts that you have to have this mindset, okay? Yep. And and what I'm telling you is is I, I firmly believe it based on what I'm hearing. You need another full time associate, and what I also hear from you is that you're willing and able to take a small pay cut for a short period of time, okay? And and that's what it's going to take six months of making a little bit less, and it probably won't even be that. And you can you can cut down time in your practice uh, because you're working. What did we say? Almost thirty hours a week patient care. Yeah, twenty seven. All right, but you should be doing. You shouldn't be doing that. Yes. You know, and and uh, and by the way, you also mentioned that you're booked out. What six weeks? Eight weeks? Ten weeks? What is it right now? Eleven and a half. 12. Okay, twelve weeks. So that's three months. So if I come to your practice, it's three months before I can see Dr. David Giuliani. Correct. That's exactly how special I am. Yeah. No, but it is right. <laughs> but it's an unbelievable problem to have, right? So, so, yeah. so I would tell you that uh, my goal for you, my disruption for you, would be to think about you personally dropping every insurance in your practice, okay, and you not doing any more fillings or limiting how many fillings you can do per day. In other words, you have to be your blo- your block scheduling has to get to a point where you need to you need to block out how many of a particular procedure that you'll do per day or per week or whatever it may be uh, in your practice. Right. 
Well, yeah. I mean, yes. And it's funny because I think I got so you get so caught up in thinking about the move and everything. That's my next moment, trying to figure out where I go with everything once we get settled in. Right. Because you should be working about 20 hours, 18 to 20 hours a week. That would be direct, direct patient care. That would be phenomenal. Okay. You should still be in your practice. You should be seeing your patients. You should be doing hygiene checks. You should be working on your other ventures. You should be, you know, allowing yourself more time for education and advanced skills. And you say it'll be heaven, so you have the ability to do it. I mean, you have, see, you know, the problem most people suffer is, is they don't have the skill set to replace themselves. Like literally all they do is restorative dentistry or cosmetic dentistry, whatever it is. But you literally have, you can do IV sedation. You can do orthodontics. You can do interceptive orthodontics. You can go learn how to do soft tissue procedures. Now, just imagine what would happen if you started doing soft tissue procedures. Where the hell would you put those patients? Yeah, well, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I would do what I've been doing for years. You see them at 8 o'clock in the morning right. for your 10 o'clock patient. So but you're, 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 not, you're not 25 years old, man. You shouldn't be doing that anymore. So oh, that's where we're going with this. I'm an old guy now. No, no, I didn't say that. I'm just saying you're not 25 anymore. I never said you're not young anymore. I just said you're not 25 anymore. <laughs> So, Correct. you know, th- th- those, so, so one of the things that we talked about on a pre call was uh, learning to reinvent yourself. And I wouldn't say that you necessarily need to reinvent yourself. You need to focus on replacing yourself. And that doesn't mean completely. That just means in a selfish way, replace yourself to become what you envision for yourself. For you to say, dude, I am so damn special. I love what I do because I only do those things I enjoy doing. And I learned to say no, just like we were talking about in the speaking stuff, right? You've gotten to a point where you now say no to certain things, correct? Right. So you need to say no to the certain things in your practice as well so that you can fo- – and in fact, you just plain told me that you enjoy the speaking a lot. It's a lot of fun for you, right? So, you know, th- those would be my, um, m- my thoughts for you would be to, uh, to focus on replacing yourself and, and doing only the things you enjoy doing uh, to bring in another associate. It sounds like you're going to have to anyway with the person being pregnant. But, um, right. Without my child. That's not my child. It's not my kid. That we know of. I mean, we're going to have a Jerry Springer. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to turn my podcast into that. You should. <laughs> how, how many children has David Giuliani fathered in his practice, right? <laughs> you got to be careful a little bit here. <laughs> I know. I, no, no, not for me. I'm talking about for yourself. No, I don't know. Zero, by the way. <laughs> well, I mean, your wife is a patient, I assume, right? Well, no, she goes. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so you fathered a few people out of your uh, out of your practice. If, if she can get in, it's about twelve weeks for even my wife to get in to see me. My, my, how about this? We send my wife statements for missed appointment fees. <laughs> she <laughs> she skips her appointments. And That's she, awesome. And one time she actually sent a check in for it. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, you cashed- you cashed it too, didn't you? Uh, well, it was, it was a check out of my checking account. <laughs> of course. That, that's kind of how my wife writes her check, out of my checking account. No, because my wife has her account, her business. I mean, she, my wife's a practicing physician, but she has her account, her business account, our joint account. <laughs> and then, and then I, I only have a joint account. That's it. So I, I don't get anything else. I mean, it's quite interesting. All right. You got any questions for me? Well, yeah, I do, actually. So now it's my turn. Yeah, put me in the hot seat. Yeah, I don't know what I can call you, fee-for-service, non-fee-for-service. I'm a a, uh, proud, uh, card-carrying, in-network PPO dentist. So how do you make that change? So how did you literally look these patients in the eye that helped you build your practice and helped you grow? You did restorations at one point. You did single crowns. How do you tell them, you know what, I know you've been with me forever, Mrs. Smith. But yeah, we're gonna let Dr. Jones see. Sure. You but, well, don't you don't. Find we it. don't. We don't do it quite like that. Okay. Uh, the answer would be: Let's pretend you're working with me, David. Okay. I'd say, Hey, Mr. Jones, uh, you need X, Y, Z taken care of. Uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll look at scheduling that. Uh, and I and I set the stage. Okay. I tell my patient, Listen, I'm right now. I'm booked out three to four months uh, for this type of procedure. Uh, if you're if you're willing to wait three to four months, I'll be happy to schedule it. If not, Dr. Giuliani could see you probably in the next couple of weeks to get this taken care of. And and then then I would go as far as saying, and Mrs. Jones, here's the truth. Quite honestly, I don't do a lot of this anymore. Um, but and Dr. Giuliani is quite honestly better than me at this. Okay, it's whatever you decide. 
and we'll yeah. be happy to take care of you. So I don't literally say, no, I won't do it. I mean, there are certain things I, I do say no to. But for the most part, I give my patients a choice. But you, you, you frame the choice in such a way that they choose what you want them to choose. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And then my team is behind me on that too. My team, you know, like, like today I had a patient that said, hey, can you do this? I said, listen, dude, you know I just work here. You know, I don't, I don't control this right. place. You just talk to the, talk to the team and, and whatever they decide. I show up eight to five, three days a week, 40 weeks a year. So if it works out one of those times, I'll be here. <laughs> so yeah. nice of you to work two days this month, right? Like, let me guess, April, you've worked two days already this no, month? No, no, I've worked, uh, today was my uh, fifth day for the month of April. Well, that's not, well, yeah, that's horrible. Never mind. Nice job. <laughs> so, so you are probably one of the busier guys I know. How are you? So you, that practice, thanks to your team, is running itself when you're not there and it runs as smoothly. No, the answer is no. Mentally, it does not run as smoothly. My ego will not accept that. That and it runs. In your mind, it doesn't run as smoothly, but no. you come back to fires. I mean, you're on the road a lot. What do you mean by what? Do you, how do you define fires? So do you come back to situations that maybe you would have handled differently? No, because I don't handle the situations in my practice now. Uh, and by that, by, by, okay, by, by that meaning, what I also mean by that is, is I've always had a, a, a method of autonomy with my, with my cer- certain team members, the half the team in my practice, is make logical, common sense decision. I will always stand behind, I tell my team, I will stand behind any decision you make the first time you make it. Okay? If, it, if, it's, if it's logical. Okay? If it's common sense. And then if it doesn't sit well with me, I'll just nicely say, listen, next time that happens, I would prefer for you to handle it this way. Okay? And it served me well. Um, I, I focus on having good people in my practice. And, and listen, David, we've gone through, okay, so I had, barring last year, okay, uh, 2013 or 14, I can't remember which one now, was my best year ever uh, until last year. And then I decided to remake my practice, reinvent the practice after my best year ever, because my best year ever required me working a boatload, okay, and seeing more patients than ever and all of that. And I just didn't want it anymore. And the problem was that I was, to a certain degree, surrounded by a certain number of people that wanted it that way, that, that wanted to do it the traditional way. And so we remade ourselves. I would say that now a team of nine people in our practice, not including the two doctors, okay, we're a team of nine. We have two people that were with me three years ago, four years ago. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, so we're not there. I, I wouldn't tell you that I've got it figured out yet. Uh, but what I would tell you is that I'm not afraid to make – now, some of those changes aren't just me. Okay, Some of those – like we had one person that moved to Charlotte because her boyfriend uh, had, a, had a good job in Charlotte, and so she moved there. Uh, we had one that, uh, you know, she had a second or third kid and she was ready to move on and, and you know, not, not be in, in dentistry anymore. So we've had some of those changes. And then we've had really tough decisions that we've had to make. And uh, we've had some, I've had some bad things, bad things. I've made some let go people that I wish I didn't let go of. But, but I, I continue to move forward in my strategy for what I want. And what I want today is very different than what I wanted five years ago. Um, and so, so you just have to keep reinventing and evolving and you can't, you can't, sometimes bigger is not always better. And, uh, and that's, that's the kind of the, um, the mindset I'm coming to now, uh, for me is I've come to the realization that I probably will never own multiple practices. I will probably never have a four five, six million dollar practice. Like I once wanted to have. Uh, but what I'm happy to right now is I want to show up, do the dentistry I want to do. I want to consistently get compensated more for the dentistry I'm doing year after year. That doesn't mean I need to make more every year. It just means I need to get compensated more for the dentistry I'm doing. And I want to work less each year than I worked the year before. Uh, so my goal right now is to work 120 days of direct patient care a year right now. And then my goal for 2018 is I want to take an entire month off in the summer. So, so my everything we're doing is based around getting to those uh, to those goals. 
Right, and I mean that's, uh, I mean that's phenomenal. You have the ability to, to do that. But no, I don't say I have the. You have the ability to do it too. Right. I, I've just I've spent the last eighteen months building towards that goal. Correct. You spent the last eighteen months building towards a goal of a beautiful office. Okay, right. so we've had different priorities over the last eighteen months. Well, and that's that's the the key. I mean, I am. I think now as I go forward, that's the next focus. How do I start thinking of an exit strategy to either own like you're talking about? And but it's not exit. It's it's just a well, lifestyle a strategy. Correct. A transition thought process. And, yeah. You know, again, I, I mean, I don't know. You know me pretty well. I'm a very Type A Italian sure. compulsive guy, and so I am like I. I'm just not Italian. Everything. Right. And but so and I like control. I, I one of these days I'll I'll fly down there. And you can tell me how you were able to let it go a little bit. Well, because in 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 the last six years I've had four associates, five associates. I've gotten be- I've gotten better each time. Uh, my first my first foray into it, I wanted somebody just like me, and then I found that we clashed. And then you know we we've j- we just you got to learn what's the most important thing for you, okay? What you're willing to give up, okay? And I have a I I have a control issue, okay? And but I said to myself that having this time away was more important than having control. So I've learned. And, and listen, I come back, and I think the team tells me they missed me just to make me feel good, uh, but. Uh, um, I come back to different types of fires. My fires aren't what happened while I was gone and what, what in the world, you know, like what in the world happened? How the hell did this happen? But more of, hey, you've let us down. You didn't get these cases done. We're behind the eight ball. Like today I had to send out uh, three implant crowns to get done because I forgot to design them before I left. And now they're due tomorrow. So I had to ask my lab to overnight them for me today. Uh, and, and the beauty of that is we're digital. So I connected them to them and, you know, uh, things like that. So, you know, it's just it's just a matter of a, a few different things here or there. Um, but I, I would say for you to write down what your ideal life would be uh, right now, okay? And, and five years from now, it should be different, okay? But what you would say would be ideal. How much do I want to make? How much time do I want to have off? What kind of procedures do I want to do? Uh, you know, who do I want to be working around? You know, who do I, you know, I I want you to think of yourself as that you are ultimately building a practice within your business. And um, I'm actually writing a book on that right now about building a a practice within your business. And um, because there are a lot of people in our situation, David, a lot of people who dentistry has been good to them. um, And we just need to do, we need to figure out how to extend our life with dentistry. Do I get an autographed copy of that when it's out? When no, it's but you have to stand in line. You have to stand in line at, at Dent Supply Serona World to get a copy of it. And uh, um, behind, your, behind your wife, who will be writing a check out of your checkbook to buy it. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> and, and you got to stand in line, and you have to pay the five dollar autograph fee. Uh, you know, but you know, on another note, you know, you know what else I've got? I've got, a, I've got a five year goal for me. And I, and I think I want to share it with people because, uh, it'll force me to not embarrass myself. I, I want to open a nonprofit dental clinic, uh, within the next five years. So I, I, I think that's great. I, I mean, just think, yes, I think that's phenomenal. I'll um, come work for you a day. I'll come work for you two days a month. Well, if you think about it, right, if you see, I, I want to go back to a couple of things that you said, and I can think this is what we'll end on because we're getting a little long here. Um, no, do you have any other questions for me? No, I think we're good. You've answered okay. them all. Okay. So, so I, when, when are you going to come to Michigan and do some lecturing and teaching? Uh, we were in Grand Rapids a few months ago, a month or so ago. I, I know. I heard you weren't here. Around. Yeah, you were. Yeah, I was down there in Charlotte. Yeah, you were in Charlotte. Uh, yeah. uh, so M- Michigan, well, now that your CON business has gone away, uh, I think they'll, it'll open up the market a little bit. I think, um, you know, I think, um, so here would be my point. And, and for those, so there are going to be those that are listening that are going to say, this is nuts. I would never spend $2 million. And there are some that don't love what they do enough to spend or invest the $2 million. And, and re, quite frankly, uh, good for you. And, and the, that listener that says that. And then there's that listener that says, God, I wish I was in a position to do that. And I, I think um, a couple of things that you said, David, that were really important to me to give you the freedom to do this was one that you said, I lived, essentially what you said is I lived uh, pretty within my means, okay, quite frankly, probably below your means, um, that you saved for your kids' college education, so that way that didn't factor into 
uh, the risk that you took uh, and that uh, you made good decisions 10, 15 years ago that gave you this opportunity uh, to be able to build your dream practice this year or this last year. And I think to me that, if nothing else, is what our listeners should take out of this episode is that the decisions you make today have long-lasting effects. And I think they should be made wisely. I think the most important thing that anybody can do is ha- listen to our podcast on the episode on having a personal and professional savings plan uh, where you save and put money away uh, like it's a bill. Uh, so that way, you, you know, you're always saving and it gives you a level of freedom and, and mental freedom. Uh, and those things are unbelievably important to do. And, and I think uh, what I'll take away from our conversation, David, is that um, I got to up my game a little bit. I, I've got to I've got to uh, look into bringing a nurse anesthetist in to do IV sedation because it's a it's a it's a holdback for me. You know, there's cases I'd like to do that I say no to because uh, I don't have the capabilities of doing IV. We do oral sedation, but there's certain things that IV is much better at. Um, I'd like to learn more about adding interceptive orthodontics to our practice. Uh, there's no reason for us to refer that out. Um, and, you know, I don't think I personally have the mentality to do it. Um, although my orthodontists have a pretty good lifestyle. I don't think they actually work. I think everybody else around them does all the work. Uh Oh, dude, that's the key to the money tree. I mean, Ortho's yeah. like, that's the golden ticket. Yeah, so, you know, I had, by the way, do you do sleep appliances? No, that's the one thing. Oh, I, I know, because you're very busy doing fillings. <laughs> yeah, and so that's what you wanted to end on. You could, okay, bye. <laughs> okay, like, I'm sorry, is this off? Is this thing on? Yeah. Um, yes, I've already talked to you about that. Yes, that is my next course. Is that easy? It's not about a course, it's just about... It's about doing it, dude. So, David, tell me, last thing, okay? I keep saying last thing to everything, okay? What do you speak on? How often are you out? How can people hear from you, learn from you? Uh, and uh, how can they get in touch with you? So, we speak on a lot of technology. I obviously, you know, on faculty at, at CEREC Doctors. So, we do a lot of, of CEREC advanced education. I also do a lot of advanced training for Serona and Patterson on CAD CAM. And now, obviously, we're doing a lot of work on treatment center efficiency and practice design and the whole process of the build. And, Can people and visit going. your practice to see what this is all about? Without a doubt, yes. We have people come through at least every month. Um, so if you're interested in looking at any of this technology, contact your um, Serona or obviously equipment specialist through Patterson, and they can easily get a hold of Serona, and they will make those arrangements. It's kind of a revolving door for anybody who wants to look at it here in North America, without a doubt. So a lot of people are coming. They're flying most people in from the West Coast through Detroit on Mm -hmm. their way to Germany to see the equipment. So they'll stay in Detroit for a day because it is a, a, a Delta hub, and you can get a direct flight right into Frankfurt out of this. So Serona does fly a lot of people from the west coast through detroit to spend a night here and then they'll head off to germany so yeah we, we get a lot of people going through the office so if you have any questions obviously talk to your equipment specialist most patterson people know of the office and it's you know there's a 3d version that they can show you online and um you can actually do a 3d walkthrough so there's pretty much not almost every piece of serona equipment we have in this office there's very little hey how, do, how does one find this three you sent me that link correct I sent you the link. Talk to your talk. Okay, to so if I put that link in my show notes, could uh, people click on that and, and view it? Without a doubt. Yep. You can do a 3D walkthrough. Um, you just click on, you know, the, the plan and then you just follow every little dot like any 3D walkthrough. Or you can go right into any room, blow it up and, and take a 360 degree look at each room and all the equipment. Yeah. So let me find this link real quick so I can put it in my uh, in my notes for people. Yeah, so anybody who wants to do the walkthrough, and Patterson can obviously also forward the the, the link. Um, there are Serona Treatment Center specialists, and they're all very much aware of it. Okay. So um, this, yeah. this Matterport cloud? Yep. Perfect. Exactly. Okay, so I'll put that in the show notes. So for anybody that wants to see and walk through your office, it's beautiful. My God. Um, uh, I'll put the link in the show notes for people to see. And your email address is djuliani, J U L I A. N-I at live.com. It sure is. <clears throat> and when you're not alive, will it be at djuliani at dead.com? 
<laughs> yeah, hopefully that's a lot later than sooner. How's that? <laughs> so how about will it be D Giuliani impregnated by me dot com? <laughs> that that's a whole dude. That is a whole lawsuit. There's a whole. <laughs> there's, yeah, all right. Yeah, there's there's a whole collective lawsuit on that right now. So that's why I got to save my money and make a lot of money to pay all these child support claims. Dave, I want to thank you so much for being on, uh, Jules. And uh, uh, and listen, we went the whole time without making fun of Rich Rosenblatt and how short he is. We don't. That that would have taken the whole time. We could have gone after that for the whole hour and a half. Uh, That's uh, awesome, David. As usual, thank you. Thanks so much for listening to T Bone Speaks with Doctor Tarun Agarwal. Remember to keep striving for excellence, and we'll catch you on the next episode.